Hello, hello. Thank you for checking out this review of Stephen King's Fairy Tale. This is my very first spoiler review and I hope that it comes across well. Uh, if this is your first time coming here, then I hope that you enjoy my channel and if you're a returner, thank you so much for coming back to visit me again and, and listen to what I have to say. Um, it means the world to me that you do. Um, if you like what you see here, I hope that you will give me a like, consider subscribing, and let's dig into my very first spoiler review of Stephen King's fairy tale. Now, I have, I generally try not to script too much what I am going to say. Um, because I'm worried I will read it. So I'm going to try really hard not to read this, but I really had to get my thoughts down because I was afraid that in front of the camera I would just blank and not say everything that I wanted to say. Um, so if you catch me reading, that's why. But um, also if there's a lot more like jumps in between, if there's a lot more edits, um, it's because I was reading what I was writing, what I had just written. So, um, so first of all, I got into this book the very first day that it came out. I started reading it and it was one o'clock in the morning and I jumped into it and it was a mistake to start it at one o'clock in the morning because I needed to go to bed and I didn't want to. I just wanted to read. I was so, so drawn in right away. Um, and I, I loved the characters and the pacing. Um, my experience with Stephen King is really of old Stephen King who, um, his pacing suffered from needing to describe everything in the world. I love descriptions. I love description heavy stuff, but there is, you know, too much of a good thing is still too much. So, and I felt like his stuff before was too much, particularly um, Stephen King's It, which I intend to try to read again, but it was so, so much description, I had to put it away. Um, so I, I was concerned that this would be the case even now, but it's not. It was really paced very well. I really enjoyed it. I was blown away in the beginning by the emotional aspect of it. I wasn't expecting to be hit so hard. I think I spent the first couple of chapters just trying not to cry. I was, it was sad. Um, sad and really sad in place. So the, the beginning of the story, it's about a boy who, I think he was like seven or something like that when, or he, he was pretty young when his mom died. And it's not really a surprise that his mom's going to die. I mean, Stephen King is, is building it up, you know, and showing you the, there's a bridge that they built and they, um, they should have built it differently. They should have done, you know, to make it, you know, not so, um, uh, dangerous and people have to drive through it while people are walking through it or walking across it. And, you know, Charlie's mom, went to walk across the bridge to go get some fried chicken for them and walk it back. And she's eating a piece of fried chicken as a truck loses control, uh, a truck driver, a, a plumber loses control of his truck and kills her, um, horrifically kills her. And, and now, you know, now Charlie doesn't have a mom and his dad has a drinking problem. Um, and you kind of see Charlie having to deal with the grief of losing his mom. And he has to kind of deal with it by himself because his dad becomes a drunk and he, he can't, he can't comfort his son because he's too busy doing what he's doing. And his son can't figure out, I mean, he almost, it's almost like he loses both parents because in a way he has to kind of become his father's parent. Um, so that was, that was very sad. <laughs> All that happened in the first chapter. So it was very sad, but in a way, I think that a lot of people, 
my age. I think a lot of people who were born before a certain time, you know, Gen Xers and, and probably even boomers and, and whatnot can relate to or have a story. A lot of people have a story about how they grew up too early. Um, they had some tragedy happen to them or some circumstance. So it doesn't even have to be a huge tragedy. It could be a circumstance of we were poor, my parents worked, I had to take care of my siblings, that kind of thing. But there are lots of stories about people who grow up too early. And I think that I can relate. I didn't have a parent die when I was a kid and the other one turned to alcoholism or anything like that. But there were circumstances in my own life that made me feel like I had to grow up uh, before I was, before I should have grown up, before I was a grown up. There were times when, when I felt like I was, um, where I would have to assume the role of the parent as far as my sisters were concerned and such went at a pretty young age. Uh, so I can kind of relate to Charlie's um, journey there. And I feel like that's very relatable for a lot of people, not just me. Not only did he have his dad kind of disappear on him into a bottle, but when his dad got sober again, he kind of reemerged, not only he kind of reemerged as a, a parental figure. And I can tell you from experience that it's difficult when you are young and you become almost like a parental figure. And then that is, you are excused from your duty here. That is no longer necessary. And it's, it's jarring to go back to being a child again, or back to assuming you, once you've grown up, it's not, you can't really pull that back. Unless you're in your 40s, I guess. I don't know. I kind of feel like I'm not as much of a grown-up now as I was when I was a kid sometimes. But it, you you don't pull that back quite so easily. Charlie did. Um, and and he, he handled it better than I did, I think. But also there was a moment, and I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but there was a moment towards the end of the book when he acknowledges that what his dad... Because, I mean, he, he expresses... A couple of times that during that time when his dad was a drunk he kind of hated his dad or resented his dad and that's all very normal feelings to have you're a child you deserve to have your other parent healthy and there for you but he was grieving too and towards the end there's a, a place where Charlie says that he acknowledges his father's grieving and that in a way that he never had before. And it really felt like it, it showed what Stephen King was trying to portray when he was talking about how Charlie has grown up through the end of the book, that he matured quite a lot. And this was really a moment where he, he showed that that was true. Um, and so I think that that was very interesting. And I know I kind of jumped way ahead and I'll back up again, but I, it was just a part of the, the book that I noticed that I liked. I really like the relationship that he had with Mr. Bowditch. Now, Mr. Bowditch was a curmudgeon -y old man who lived up the road from him, across the bridge, the goddamn bridge. He keeps calling it the goddamn bridge, and I, I actually like that he does that as much as I don't necessarily like that word, but it's, he feels there's, the bridge is somewhat blamed for what happened to his mom, and his reference to the bridge and he never fails to reference it as the goddamn bridge. And it's almost in a way when, like when he does it, I, I thought it was going to get annoying, but it didn't actually. And towards the end, when he does it, it's almost grounding. It almost grounds you into the story a little bit. And so I kind of liked that. Um, I wasn't mad at it. I, I, I just, it was a detail that Stephen King never failed to, to remember to add in it. And I, I appreciated that actually. But anyway, um, Mr. Bowditch lives on the other side of the bridge and he's a crotchety old man with a, a German shepherd that was described as being a mean and, you know, vicious dog, a Cujo-like dog. Um, and he actually referenced Cujo in the book. Not in a dark tower, everything is connected to everything else in Stephen King's world kind of way. He referenced it as in the movie of Cujo. I always wondered 
in Stephen King's world, do some of the characters have Stephen King books on their shelves? Is he meta enough that his, some of his characters are his fans? I, I don't know. I always wondered, and I haven't read enough of his books to really know. But in this sense, he, he referenced Cujo like it's a movie in his world. If it's a movie in his world, then it's a book in his world, right? And so then Stephen King has written a book in Stephen King's world. Is that not the case? If you know, if, if there's, if there's other books where he's done that, uh, leave me a comment. Let me know which ones I'd be interested in, in knowing if, if that's just something that he does, that he acknowledges himself or he builds himself into his own world. Anyway, it was just, it was, it was kind of a cool reference because I thought it in my head right before I heard it, right before it, it came in the book. And, and I thought, uh, that that was kind of cool. It was fun. Anyway, Mr. Bowditch. Um, with his Cujo like dog and, um, uh, he was stopped in front of the, of the old man's house for a moment, resting because he was gripping his handlebars too tight and he was shaking out his hands, which I appreciated as a, a detail. That's something I remember from when I used to ride bikes when I was a kid is that sometimes you can grip those things so tight, you lose feelings in your finger. You got to stop and shake out your hands. Um, and I just kind of appreciated that, that little detail. And he stopped in front of the man's house and he heard the dog giving a, a low whiny howl and he heard the man say help from the backyard. And so he goes back there and the man's fallen, he tried to clean his gutters and he fell and he had broke his leg, a compound break in his leg. And he lives by himself. He doesn't have any friends. He doesn't go anywhere. He has this stuff delivered to him. If he, if Charlie hadn't have stopped when Charlie did, if he hadn't have heard the dog and decided to go around and not be afraid of the scary dog that his friend told him about when he was younger, then the old man probably would have died of, of exposure staying out there in the cold all night long with a broken leg. But he goes back there, he sees him, he calls 911, he gets some help. Um, and then they become friends. They, it's, it's a really kind of cool relationship and he's very curmudgeon -y. And I have an uncle, it's one of my, uh, my favorite uncle and, and I love him. But he's, he's a very curmudgeon -y man. And I just think he's a lot of fun. And I don't know, he just, this character reminded me of my uncle and I liked that. He had a bad break and, and he kind of hurt himself in other ways as well. Um, so they were talking about how he was talking about how he may have to put his dog down because he wasn't going to be able to return home for long enough that, that his aging dog, cause his dog, dog's not vicious anymore. His dog's kind of aging and getting up there and, and he was worried that he might have to put the dog down because who could take care of his dog? And Charlie's like, don't do that. I'll take care of the dog. And he took care of the dog and then he decided to become Mr. Bowditch's um, caretaker when he got out of the hospital. Now he's a 17 year old kid at this point. I don't think anyone thought that he 100% thought he was going to stick with it or that he was going to be able to do it. But he did and his, his dad was like, okay, if you think you can do this, if you want to try this, you know, go for it. But, um, you know, he, he spent a lot of time with him. And I think there's something that's really kind of cool about when the young spend time with the elderly. Um, I used to volunteer at a nursing home when I was in high school. And um, I used to love to, uh, there was a, a, a lady that I used to love to go and read to. She was blind and uh, she had audiobooks, but back then audiobooks were books on cassette. Um, and sometimes it was harder to uh, get the right cassette in the right order. And you don't want to call a CNA to just to do something like that. Or she didn't anyway. Um, so I would come and I would read to her and listen to her stories. And, and I, I worked at the nursing home after high school. And, um, and it was really inter interesting to hear some of their stories. Um, I think it can enrich 
a younger person's life to get that kind of um, perspective. And many of the people who work there in swing shift were like high school kids and they didn't have time for it. They didn't care about it. They weren't interested in an old person's perspective, but I really feel like sometimes when an older person and a younger person makes a connection, it can really be special. And there's this relationship between Charlie and Mr. Bowditch was very special. I, I really enjoyed, um, I really enjoyed that perspective. The time he spent with Mr. Bowditch, there, it almost like somebody described this book, like the first part of the book being almost like a slice of life type perspective. And, and maybe in, in a way it was, and maybe in a way I wish it would have continued. Like Charlie not only became his caretaker, but he wanted to, you know, help fix the fence that was kind of falling down and mow the lawn that was really, really high up with um, weeds and, and dog poop all in the backyard because he's an old man, he's not getting back there to clean it as much. And, and, you know, he, the roof is leaking and he wants to see to the roof and he wants to, you know, the, one of the things he notices when he's kind of dog sitting, house sitting until Mr. Bowditch comes back is that he, he has tons of groceries that, you know, he's kind of a hoarder with his groceries and such and, and kind of a hoarder with his old newspapers and magazines and uh, books and, and whatnot. But he, um, he starts to do some home improvement things to make it the house better, more livable for Mr. Bowditch, but just, you know, to, just to help him out. And he kind of goes above and beyond in my opinion, but I kind of wish he'd have gone further. I mean, I was there for it. I was suddenly it was going to turn into a flip this house episode or something. And I was there for it. I would have loved to see more. I would have loved to see him like break out the tube to, to get some cooking videos so that he could cook up some of that food that Mr. Bowditch was hoarding. Um, and, and so the tube is kind of a funny reference to something later, but, um, I would like to see more of that, more of their time together. Um, and I, I enjoyed the parts about Radar. Radar is the dog and, and, um, Radar was a very sweet dog. Totally understand why Charlie fell in love with Radar. Kind of did myself and, um, just a smart, sweet, well-behaved dog, um, getting up there in age. And it's sad when a dog is getting up there in age. It's sad to, to be taken care of of your aging dog. I sort of did that as well. I mean, I had a dog that was getting up there in age and she ended up with, with bone cancer and it was very sad. There's a lot of aspects to this book that I can relate to in different times of my life. It's kind of odd that way, but, but maybe that's what makes it so endearing is because there's a lot of people who can relate to having a dog that, or a pet of any kind that was aging and having to watch it go through those times, wishing that there was something you could do about it. And there's a lot of people who, you know, kind of grew up too young. And there's a lot of people who, there's just a lot of these elements that, that can relate to a lot of people. So that's part of what I think what makes the first half so good. One of the things that, that spending time with Mr. Bowditch did was it started to introduce the mystery of the shed and it started to introduce some of the more fantasy slash horror -y bits of the uh, story. So the mystery of the shed in the backyard of Mr. Bowditch's house started out a little horror, like there was some scratching coming from the inside and it gave Charlie chills and it, it felt otherworldly and radars growling at it. Like there's some, something is going to try and break through from inside the shed. What's inside the shed? The shed is locked with a padlock and nobody's gone in and out of there. And at first he thinks maybe a raccoon or something has gotten in there and is trying to get its way out. But he feels like it's otherworldly. He feels like there's something not quite right about what's trying to break through. So, and it gives you kind of a sense of foreboding. The ball was dropped here. This is kind of the beginning of 
where I feel like the ball was dropped a little bit. Because what was on the other side, I mean, the scratching, all that happened later on. I mean, it, he kind of forgets about it, but then later on, Mr. Bowditch is back and then there's, you know, Radar is getting her hackles all up and something is banging from the inside. And Mr. Bowditch takes a gun and goes out there and shoots something and he doesn't want to talk about what happened. <laughs> But he shoots something from the other side and it was so horrific and so scary that it started a heart attack. I mean, he didn't die right away, but he wasn't feeling good. He was not doing well for a couple of days and then he had a heart attack and he died. I mean, but he kind of knew thing. He knew it had started with the horror of what was in the shed. But then all that turned out to be in the shed was a cockroach. It was a big cockroach. It was an oversized cockroach. Cockroaches are gross, so okay. I can kind of say that if I saw a cockroach that was the size of a dog, I'd be horrified as well. I'm not sure I'd shoot it with a gun, but I'd be horrified. And it kind of gave an impression of whatever was in the shed or whatever the shed led to was maybe a horror-filled world with huge insects. I'm I'm picturing starship troopers now, you know. I'm picturing huge insects that, you know, want to kill you. But that's not what we got. So, I really feel like it was kind of a disjointed I don't know, I feel like he worked in the horror elements and he did good with the horror elements and then he said, "Nope, I'm not writing horror. I'm actually writing fantasy." And I think he should have stuck with horror a little bit more. I think making this be even darker of a fantasy might have been better. I don't know. I'll, you'll see kind of what I mean when I when I go on. Uh, it just didn't. It was the wrong flavor. Maybe or it was the right flavor, but then switched to the wrong flavor. I don't know. I would, I feel like the cockroaches were supposed to be a, a portent of doom, but it wasn't. And you never saw them again. It was such a big problem that he had it, he had it board, you know, there, it was a well inside of there and he had the well boarded up to keep things from coming up. And then it was just big cockroaches. It wasn't anything. So the, so the shed had a well in it and the well had a staircase in it. You go down the staircase, you go through a corridor and you're in another world. It, it's a portal world. You kind of go through a portal, if you will. And, um, it sort of makes you feel disjointed for a minute and then you're in the other world. And there are bats in the corridor and they're bigger than regular bats and the cockroaches are as big as dogs and so you start to get the idea you're going to giant land everything there is so going to be so big which is interesting to me but it's, it wasn't really like that it was the cockroaches were big and the bats were big and the rats were big and the rabbits were big but the people were normal sized people. The horses were normal sized horses. It's like, really we only had things be big when we needed them to be big, but there was no explanation as to why things were so much bigger or why some things were so much bigger and then other things really just mimicked our world. I mean, it was clear he wasn't in Indiana anymore, but it didn't feel like he was, oh, it didn't always feel like he was in another world. It, it felt like maybe he was in the country of our world. I didn't understand why some of the elements needed to be gigantic elements and some of the elements weren't. Um, they had, towards the end, they referenced fireflies, but I don't think the fireflies were humongous. So it wasn't like all the insects were big. They did have a gigantic cricket. But I mean, it just, so it just feels like there was, things were big when they needed to be big and there was no real explanation as to why they needed to be big other than it was kind of cool. So he goes through the, the portal, he ends up at the end of the corridor and, and he's in a new world, Impus, and 
at first all he sees is a field of poppies. They smell like cinnamon, vanilla-y, cozy, warm, wonderful smelling poppies. And there's a house and there's a clothesline of shoes. Um, and you know, it's, but it doesn't look like a drastically different world than our world does. There are two moons, but you can't really see the moons most of the time because there's a lot of cloud cover all the time. Um, but there are a lot of fairy tale aspects to this world, which I really enjoyed actually. Um, there were some things where the, the buildings would seem to change when you looked at them in your periphery. Um, but then when you looked at them straight on, they were back to the way they were, but it was unsettling to the, to Charlie. It wasn't unsettling to the reader. In my opinion, he didn't go far enough with that. This is another aspect where I feel like he added some horror elements to it, but didn't go far enough. He didn't, he didn't go Stephen King with this horror. There were definitely some homages to different fairy tales. Um, there was, um, the woman with the shoes was kind of like the old woman who lived in a shoe, except for she didn't, but she repaired shoes and, but she was, there was sort of some correlation there, the little mermaid, Cinderella, a lot of the Brothers Grimm stuff. And it was very much like a Brothers Grimm world. And I liked that. It was sort of like trying to, to show these fairy tales before they were scoured and made more palatable for, uh, for children when they were really fairy tales, when they were really horror tales and, um, and not Disney-fied. So I really appreciated that, but I think it could have gone further. A lot of the people in this world were afflicted with a curse where their skin was turning gray and starting to, it was described as melt off. They were becoming deformed. They couldn't speak because their lips were starting to fuse together and, and their mouths were breaking and their eyes were becoming deformed, like they couldn't see through some of them. They were kind of squinted or closed over, like the skin was growing over their face. Um, there were some people who were not afflicted with it, um, but for the most part, the, the majority of the people seemed to be cursed. So there's a curse on this land, very fairy tale like but This is about the, where the book turn, took a real big turn for me. In the, I, I have already said this is the place where the book started to, but that was nothing compared to now. So Charlie goes to this world and he, he has heard that there is a sundial that if you, if you sit on the sundial and you turn it backwards, that it can reverse aging. So he's trying to cure radar. His whole quest is to take Radar and to kind of cure her from old age a little bit, kind of make her, he doesn't want to make her a puppy, but he, he does want to sort of reverse some of the, the effects that aging is having. She is having a hard time. She can't walk very well anymore. Her back legs aren't supporting her. Her eyes are getting all roomy. Her, her snout is turning all white and she's just, she's old and she's suffering and she's coughing and she's wheezing and she's not very far from the end. And he doesn't want her to die too. I mean, he lost his mother. He lost Mr. Bowditch. He doesn't want to lose Radar too. And he inherited Radar and all of Mr. Bowditch's stuff. So this is his dog now and he's not going to let his dog die. Even if he's got to go to a whole other world to make sure that that happens. So that's his quest. That's what he's setting out to do. That's why he endures what he endures. And he goes to sort of, it turns into almost like a little bit of a D and D dungeon crawl where you're sort of led. So he goes to the house with the shoes and then she points him to the girl with the, the goose girl. And then she points him to another person and then he points 
him to another person who gives him directions on how to get to the sundial and, and back, right? But it gets real long and drawn out. The quest part is too much, too drawn out, too, too, too much description, too much kind of, he slowed down the pace of the whole book to where this is where I started to wonder if I was ever going to get done with it because I was like, oh, I only have nine more hours left on it. These were the longest nine hours of a book, I swear. It was just a long trek there. And Mr. Bowditch put, you know, his initials all over the place and from when he had visited there before. And he's following the initials. The initials point this way. They point that way. They go to this place, do this thing. It was a lot. It was a lot of that. And it was just finally you were just like, get on with it already, you know? If it was a YouTube video that said, come, you know, here's a timestamp for when this part is over with, I'd have clicked it. It was just, it was very drawn out. And then, you know, he succeeds in healing his dog, but on the way out, he gets lost and uh, he gets captured and then he's in a dungeon and he's there forever. And then, I don't know, he sort of becomes the chosen one. <laughs> and then it's a lot. There's a lot of people. There's He makes 31 people in the dungeon. They're trying to get to 32 so that they can fight a bunch of other people, a group of 32 people, to the death because 32 is divisible all the way down. And so then it turns into sort of a survive the dungeon, survive a gladiator event type thing. It was, it really was too much. It could have been, um, shortened quite a lot. You could, I really feel like he could have made you, given you information, made you hate the big bad guy, um, in a much shorter amount of time. He, you know, even at one point he has Charlie, the narrator who is like 26 or something like that. He's a 26 year old man. Who's telling the story of what happened to him when he was 17. So in story, the uh, story, Charlie, the, the character is 17 and Charlie, the narrator is 26. But there are sometimes when Charlie, the narrator kind of interrupts the story to say, you know, the, the gray people, their mouth is sort of breaking and they can't speak. They can't articulate. And so they mumble. And so he, he, sometimes he draws that out where, you know, one of them is really trying to get a, a piece of information across to him and, and it takes several tries. And then there are other times when he says, I'm going to spare you the, the mumbling and stuff like that. Why, why sometimes and why not other times? There's sometimes when he pauses in the middle of his storytelling to say, sorry, I'm throwing a bunch of names out to you that have you have no context for, but I think it's important that their names be known, even if, if only for a brief moment. But he apologizes for it because it's boring and it's just throwing out names, 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 this person, this person, this person. It's like the beginning of the Bible. So-and-so beget, this person beget, that person beget, just throwing out names with no context. And you don't care about any of these names because you don't care about these are any, they're not even characters. You don't know what color their eyes are. You don't know if they're tall or short. They're just names. They're just people. So that's kind of too, it's too much. It's just not, he slowed way down. And I kind of wish he had taken this kind of time with the beginning of the book and maybe sped up the pace, um, kind of, you know, the pacing of the beginning of the book was more reflected here because it was just not, not good after a while. It just started. It's not so much that the book was bad. It's not so much that I wasn't enjoying it, some aspects of it, but I was just, I felt like I was like, okay, let's go. Let's go. move it along. In a way, one of my criticisms of this book and one of the reasons why I think and I could be wrong. I'm just, I probably shouldn't tell you this is why other people didn't like the book. So I, maybe I won't do that. But I think that one of the problems with the book 
for those who might have a problem with the book is that it almost reads a little bit like a YA book in a way. It's not a YA book. At least I don't think it is. I don't think it's marketed that way. But I mean, you do have a 17 year old kid as the main character, but there are some aspects of this fantasy world where I feel like he could, I feel like he's trying to erase the, the Disney-fied version of the fairy tale to give you the real Brothers Grimm version of the fairy tale. But he doesn't go far enough, in my opinion. He makes some choices that really makes the story more, maybe more appropriate for a, a, a teenager and not maybe as interesting to an adult. If he were to take these Brothers Grimm flavored stories, if he were to make them more horror, I, I wanted a little more horror in my fantasy, I guess. I, I don't, I, I was in, I was really wanting this to be a fantasy book because that, I mean, that's what it was to, uh, sold to me as. And I was like, Ooh, Stephen King does fantasy. And I know a lot of people say Dark Tower is fantasy and I'm not going to fight you on that because I've never read them. But this was for sure fantasy and there are fantastical elements to it. So for sure it is fantasy, but I wanted, I guess, more horror in it. I wanted to feel disturbed by the descriptions, not, not like rolling my eyes at the description. And here's an example. There's a giant that lives in the castle whose name is Hannah. Hannah, is, the way that Hannah is described is almost like he's got a young person in mind, like he's telling the story to a young person rather than to an adult. One of the things that he talks about, besides how hideously ugly Hannah is, is that she's got a great big pimple on her chin that she's eating whatever and there's bones littered all over and she's noisy and messy and belches and whatever. And then she's got this great big pimple and she chooses this time to reach up and squeeze it and just buckets of pus is, you know, running out and she just wipes it with her hand and continues on and then starts singing some song about sex. But it's not like, it's like an attempt at raunchy, but it's very kind of kitted down. Like, the kind of gross that he uses is a gross that kids would enjoy. Kids like fart jokes and, and kids like burp jokes and, and pus and gross and, you know, slime and putty and, you know, kids like that. Adults are a little more, I mean, we want to see disturbing. We want to be disturbed. And he, you've already introduced elements of, dark fantasy. And I wanted to be disturbed. I wanted the descriptions to be less, you know, fart jokes and more, why should, don't just tell me this thing is terrifying. Terrify me. Terrify me. Don't just say it's terrifying because it's big and it's gross because it's got a big old pussy pump pimple on its chin. Terrify me. But it almost feels like it almost feels like he goes through the process of trying to undisney these things and then he sort of almost puts his own he almost tempers it for children just in a different way it feels kind of like he makes it more palatable for a young audience anyway even though it feels like he's also trying to undo that, undo what Disney did, but then he kind of does, he puts his own spin on, on making it childlike. Having said that, <laughs> as much as it feels like he was kind of trying to make this YA, it doesn't always feel like Stephen King has his finger on the pulse of youth. Uh, one of the things he did was he referenced you know, Charlie looking something up. He opened up Safari to do it. In 2014? Probably not. Probably he Googled it, but it was just, 
it was just kind of a funny reference that really um, dated the, it really dated the, the story, the, and it's a brand new story. So um, he, he had Charlie call YouTube the tube. Um, so lots of videos on the tube. I see more of the tube in my future. And do kids call it the tube? I don't, I don't think they do. I've never heard it. I granted I'm, I'm, you know, 45 years old, not a kid. And my kid is 10. So she's, it's not like she's a teenager and a good representation of that. But I, I've never heard people call it the tube before. There was a lot of reference to the internet as the net, which I guess did happen a little bit, but not in 2014. I don't feel like, I don't know. I just, it feels like He's trying to make up what he thinks kids talk like, and he's missing the mark a little bit. Also, there are some ways, like, he references a lot of horror in the beginning of the book. He talks a lot about the movie Psycho. Um, he referenced Cujo briefly. But Psycho is kind of a, a, an old horror reference. And a 17-year-old in 2014 maybe wouldn't have... And, and it maybe wouldn't have a very good grasping of the movie Psycho, um, especially because when it was brought up, because they called Mr. Bowditch's house the Psycho House, and and that it looked like, you know, the Bates's house or whatever, and and um, they talked about the the shower scene with the the knife and whatnot, but. At that time, they were younger than 17. It feels like a movie that that a kid in the early 2000s was not watching. Now, his dad does watch a lot of the classic, turn of classic movie channel or whatnot. Uh, he references it a lot. He's seen a lot of older movies. And I get that. Uh, I get that as a, a teenager more than as a kid. But... He doesn't seem to watch anything that the other kids watch. When I was in high school, what I watched was somewhat... I mean, I, I didn't only watch what other people were watching, but some of what you did, what you wanted to talk about the next episode of whatever, you couldn't talk about what The Simpsons were doing if you weren't watching The Simpsons. And you couldn't talk about, you know, Friends if you weren't watching Friends and so on and so forth. So there was a lot of, there was none of that. I mean, he didn't watch TV at all other than old movies that his dad liked to watch. And that just kind of didn't feel like a 17 year old kid or, or even younger. Um, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more updated horror being talked about newer horror that that a kid in the of the 2000s would have really watched or referenced or whatever. As a kid, I used to go to the movie theater with my friends all the time. Did this kid not have friends that he went to the movie theater with? And he didn't seem to. He seemed to do homework and be at home and didn't really seem to have a lot of friends at all. Except for when he needed to have friends. When he needed to have a friend, he could call a friend up and say, Hey, I need your help. But he didn't like have friends. He didn't nobody's calling him to see how he's doing. Nobody's he's not calling anybody. He's not like you know, nobody's like, Hey, what's the creepy old guy's, you know, house like that your house sitting at? And oh no, it's fine, it's whatever. I needed to tell my best friend about what radar did. No, there's none of that. He doesn't have friends except for when he needs to. So he kind of comes across as a very atypical teenager anyway. So at the end, storming the castle, defeating the bad guys, that whole thing, you know, he, he escaped from the dungeon and then the whole world rallied with him to defeat the bad, bad you know, which is very fairy tale-ish and, and that's, that's fine. It's just the whole thing though could have been pared down a lot. The princess was very cold towards him, whereas before she was not. And I didn't really like that very much. I got the reasoning why, but it was, I just didn't like it. But she was very like single-minded. 
let's do this task, this one task. And he's like, no, we've got other tasks to do too. I mean, I got to save this person. He, he has helped, he helped us survive and I got to kill this person. He was the bane of my existence while I was here. And, and the whole time she's just like, come on, come on, come on, come on. And she's, and he, he describes, she's making this motion a lot. Um, cause she can't speak. Her mouth has been, um, so she can't speak, but she is constantly hurry it up. Let's get going. Let's get going. And it, it's a theme because I'm feeling like let's get going because it, it drags. She has to drag him through this dungeon, or the dungeon, this castle, this dungeon crawl that they're doing to get to the big bad because he keeps coming off and doing side quests. And it's frustrating for her, but it's also frustrating for the reader for her to be like, let's move it along because she's really the reader's voice at that moment because we're saying, let's move it along. And if he pared this part down a lot, he would have had much more room to improve the end. You know, they defeated the, 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 the mobs, the, the, the mid-level mob went and defeated the main mob, you know, the made bad guy or whatnot. Um, but I, I didn't like, I just, I didn't like how it dragged and it, and it did drag on. I also didn't like some of the language, like they called him the prince that was promised. It was very Game of Thrones. I'm watching, rewatching Game of Thrones right now. And it just kind of hit me as very Game of Thrones language to use. But, um, you know, he suddenly, you know, he's brown hair, brown eyed guy, but he started getting blonde hair and blue eyes and he's becoming the prince that was promised that will help them defeat the bad guys. He's the chosen one comes in, but the princess who's there is kind of, you know, she makes a point of telling him, you might be a prince, but you're not the prince of this land. She doesn't use all those words, but you know, she doesn't, she throws her voice. She doesn't use words because she doesn't have a mouth. But she does make a point of putting him in his place, which is he's not the prince here and she is the princess here. So, and she, you know, he kills Hannah, the big giant. And then after Hannah's dead, she goes over there and whaps Hannah with her sword. Like, cause she's got to put what the final, she's got to have the last word. I don't know. I just, I didn't like that part. And I didn't like her in this moment. Then after, after he escapes, after they defeat the big bad, he's injured and he goes through recovery time. <sighs> like weeks and weeks of recovery. And he just, instead of saying, you know, after about three weeks, he started feeling more clear headed and his arm was feeling better. And then move on with the story. It was just, you know, so-and-so was sitting by my bed. Then this person came and sat by my bed. Then this person did. And then another person, this person, you know, sometimes dead people were coming to visit me and sometimes it was living people. And it was the other, it was just boring. It was just a list of here's the people who came and talked to me. It was, it was like, it was like he was trying to tie up too many, all the loose ends, you know, writers don't have to tie every single loose end. It gets monotonous, especially when they do it in a list like that. And he was thinking about his dad and hoping he hadn't relapsed into drinking. And I'm thinking, me too, man. I'm hoping your dad is not out there drinking himself silly because he's lost his wife. Now he's lost his kid and he doesn't know where, where his kid is. His kid just leaves one day and you're just laying here in the lap of luxury. What's going on? You know, it just wasn't the lap of luxury. He was re honestly recovering. It just felt like this is part that King could have trimmed down and moved on. I thought maybe because he was in a different world that maybe time would work differently. And I almost wish that that's what happened. Although I'm a fan of consequences to actions. He went on this journey and the consequence of this journey is that his dad thought he had died and was missing him and papered the town with, have you seen this kid? Have you seen this dog? Um, 
because I mean, he left a note for his dad. His dad was away for the weekend on a conference and he left a note for his dad, went to Chicago because there's an experimental treatment for radar. We'll be back soon kind of thing. <laughs> and then he's gone for four months. And, um, so I kind of had wished that time had worked differently in the portal world than it does in earth. And so maybe he comes back to only be gone a week and his dad's mildly upset, but not, you know, four months. And I thought he, you were dead kind of thing. That's not what happened. And that's okay because consequences to actions, but then the consequences weren't real consequences. I mean, yes, they papered the town with his face. Have you seen this boy? Have you seen this dog? But he walks into his dad's house and his dad's like, I thought you were dead. They hug each other. He says, where were you? He says, I was in a portal world. And he says, okay, where were you really? He says, no, really, I was in a portal world. I'll show you. And he's like, you know, his dad doesn't really know what to believe, but Radar kind of convinces him because he's got some of the same porcupine scarring, which was never mentioned anywhere in the book ever until right here at the end. Um, you know, he got Radar, she got a face full of porcupine quills at one point and his dad remarked on the, the, the scars there after Mr. Bowditch had died, except for that he didn't. Now, Charlie's like remembering how that had happened, but that was never brought up in the book. So it was just like conveniently they're, they're put there so that Charlie's dad, you know, starts to believe this is the same dog from before. And then he says, okay, so I know what you want. You want a happy ending. This is Charlie, the narrator breaks the fourth wall to say, let me give you the happy ending you want. This happened, that happened, that happened. My life went this way and I became a professor of English and I, I wrote a really titillating paper about fairy tales and now everyone loves me and I'm a, you know, whatever. There you go. You got your happy ending, which seemed really smarmy to me. It really seemed like, like he wasn't actually giving us the happy ending he wanted. He was giving us his outline for the happy ending. And I wish he would have spent less time writing the dungeon crawl and more time writing the happy ending, you know, maybe outline the dungeon crawl a little bit and, and spell out the happy ending. Bring us back to that pacing and the, the feel and the flavor of what you gave us in the beginning of the book. Give that to us at the end of the book too. Sandwich it so that way the stuff in the portal world doesn't seem like such a letdown. But when he came home, when he came to Earth, when he came back, I thought, finally, and maybe it will redeem itself. But no, it's like, here's an outline for what a happy ending would look like. You make it up. <laughs> you know, it was just... Also, while I was listening to it, I really thought that King was trying to draw a parallel between horror stories and fairy tales. And maybe he wasn't, maybe I made this up, which is maybe I made this up. I was sure he was doing it. Then he didn't complete it or finish it or finish making the connections. And then I feel let down by him. Maybe it was never a parallel he was trying to draw to begin with. To me, in the, in the beginning of the book, he references a lot of horror. He references some sci-fi. He talks about how some of what is an emphasis that might be reflected in our literature because authors that belong to our world might have visited, such as Frank Baum, because he mentions that the, the city looks like an emerald city. It's, you know, green and glassy and, and it looks like the emerald city. And he talks about Ray Bradbury and how the sundial reminds him of, of an aspect of, um, uh, which book was it? I think it was, um, something wicked this way comes or something. So he talks about how he's, he even, Mr. Bowditch even makes a connection. Like he says, I'm sure that he must have visited, but no, that's impossible. And, and so then it kind of feels like some of our, some of our sci-fi people, some of our, uh, fantasy people, some of our philosophers may have visited and maybe so, maybe there are other portals to this world. It doesn't say one way or the other, but it feels like with all the references, with all the, the references to horror and some to sci-fi and stuff like that, it feels like he's trying to make a connection between the horror and the fairy tales 
it was it was interesting how he he didn't try to hide his influences. There was Lovecraft, Lovecraft in there. There was um, there was a lot of you know Brothers Grimm. There was a lot of of these elements that he was drawing from, and he said he was drawing from. And I just it I don't know. It felt like there was a bridge he was trying to build, and then he stopped in the middle. Having said all of that, there were a lot of elements of this book that I did like, and I just kind of want to list out some of them. I don't want it to sound like don't get this book. It was dumb. It wasn't. It was very enjoyable in many places. There was just some places where it was less. But I really liked that this world led to a portal to another world, and then that world led to a portal to a third world. I wasn't expecting another portal to another world. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Usually, if in portal worlds, like in Narnia or something like that, you go to Narnia, there's not a portal to another world, only Earth. Earth and Narnia are linked, but not other worlds, not other portals, it seems like. And I don't, I don't think I've ever seen that before. So I, I really liked that. I thought that was cool that, you know, to the third world, there might have been, if they explored that more than 20 feet in, they, there might have been another portal to another world. Uh, it might have been turtles all the way down. <laughs> So I liked the addition of so many of the fairy tales. I really did. I I really enjoyed, because I love the Brothers Grimm fairy tales. When I was younger, I used to read them. And I read them to my sister and stuff. And so I enjoyed revisiting that and seeing them a little closer as to how they were imagined in mythology, to how they were written back then and not Disney-fied. I, he made a big point of saying that he wasn't a Disney prince and, and that, you know, that, you know, it, this isn't a Disney fairy tale. And, and he did a good job, I think, of, of showing how it was not. But, um, I really liked seeing a lot of the different elements. The, you know, there was Rumpelstiltskin, like, characters in it. Um, quite a few, actually, references to Rumpelstiltskin, um, and Cinderella and, and other I don't think he went far enough, but I do, I was, I didn't appreciate all of those references. I love that when he was talking to the, the people in Empus that they thought of our world as the magical world. They didn't think of their world as the magic world. And, and I thought that was kind of a fun idea. Usually, if it's a world with magic in it, they recognize themselves as a magical world. And Charlie makes a quote, and this is probably not exactly word for word, but he makes a quote that says, I think all worlds are magic worlds, but the people in it just sort of get used to the magic. And I thought that was a very cool concept, a very cool moment. And, and I really enjoyed that. I actually, one of the things that people had problems with was the way that King titled his chapters. And I actually really liked it. He would start the, the, chapter the he would title his chapters with sort of you know this thing is going to happen then this thing then this thing and not he didn't tell you everything but he would say you know the princess or the goose girl or the radar finds his toy whatever i mean he would sort of do that and then within each chapter he would have you know one and then he would do his thing and when he break two and so there's like mini chapters within each chapter. And I, I like that. I really felt like that helped the pacing. And it, it helped you feel like you were accomplishing more faster. You were listening. I mean, it was 24 hour book, 24 hours and some, some change. Uh, and it was going to be 24 hours no matter what you did. But it just felt faster because of the way it was numbered. Uh, some people didn't like that. They thought it was kind of spoilery. I didn't mind that at all, although there were a couple of times when Charlie the narrator did break the fourth wall and spoil, like he would break the fourth wall to say, I shouldn't have let this person do this or else this consequence wouldn't have happened, but I didn't know. And then he would go on with the story and you're like, damn man, what, what, what happened? Where, where are you going with that? What happened? And then it would kind of cause anxiety, but kind of the wrong kind of anxiety, not the suspense, tension, anxiety, but kind of, I don't know, just, it didn't, I didn't always like that part, but 
I didn't mind the way he titled things and I, I did like the pacing of the book quite a lot. <clears throat> I love how at the end he becomes, Charlie becomes like an English professor and he's kind of a rock star in that field. Um, but I would have liked to see more on that front. Um, it would have been, I don't know, maybe more interesting. This is another part where I'm like short in the middle and length in the end. Maybe it would have been kind of interesting to see how he, how the world of Empus really influenced him throughout those years. How it, not just because I went to fairy tale land, I became somewhat of an expert on fairy tales. And then I wrote a paper and then I became a professor. But like really kind of show more, I guess. Uh, but I did like where he ended up. It's just, again, it's the outlining the happily ever after. Maybe just either don't have it be a happily ever after or give us more than an outline. <clears throat> so those were my thoughts on this book. Again, I know I used a lot of this time to talk about the things that were frustrating or whatnot about the book, but... Uh, but I still would give the book a 3.5 out of a 3. Point, yeah, 3.5 out of 5. I would still give this book a 3.5 out of 5. Um, I I said I wasn't gonna do half stars, but giving it only three stars means I think that would it would do it a disservice, especially the excellent beginning to the book and and like the excellent first third of the book. Um, but doing a four star, I think would be maybe giving it too much because of the really, really slow middle and the sort of rushed end. So I think three and a half stars is where I'm going to have to be with this one. And, and I'm just gonna have to make my peace with that. But I enjoyed the experience. I'm glad I did it. The read along was fun. The doing the vlog was fun. And I hope you check out the vlog. Um, I, I enjoyed reading Stephen King again, and and I hope to do it again. I think I'll pick up more of his books that he's written kind of more recently um, and see what they're about and, and um, hopefully be able to give it higher than a three and a half star. But, uh, but even a, a three and a half star, King's a very good writer. Stephen King is a very accomplished writer, and even a three and a half star Stephen King book is a pretty pretty good book pretty fun fun ride I, I really did have a good time with it um and i had a great time being able to bring you my thoughts on the subject so i enjoyed it all over again so that's what i have for you today and i hope you had a good time i hope this didn't i see right now it's over an hour long so we'll see what happens in editing but i i hope that this wasn't too long of a of a uh a video for you and that you had a good time listening to my point of view on it and, and what I liked and what I didn't like. And if you did, please uh, consider subscribing, hit me up with a like, and it really helps out my channel and it's free to do. And I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you. So thank you very much. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.